think, crikey, have I got something in my teeth? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to our four o'clock session on Friday. I've given up counting what number session we're on for what day on Friday. Um, delighted to be joined by Joe, who is the um, founder of the Geeky app and the Geeky Badges app. And she's going to talk to us. Um, we had a session earlier on with the, in the week with um, Luke Gaden from Terra Nutra about sort of carbon footprints and carbon offsetting. And Joe's going to talk to us a little bit more about, about, I guess, our own sort of individual carbon footprints and um, and then introduce her amazing sounding new app to us and, and talk us through that. Claire's already said um, she's a bit nervous about the science and maths bit. Don't be so, um, Claire, we'll try and, well, I'll speaking on Joe's behalf, but like try and keep it as jargon free as um, as possible. I know that's one of the things, um, you know, Luke Red had all this sort of jargon busting thing. Um, uh, as usual, guys, there's the the comments, uh, the chat box there. People are already um, commenting mostly about maths um, in the comment box, so do just um, chat away in there. And if you've got a specific question to ask, hopefully you're all used to this by now. There's that ask a question box at the bottom, and I'll jump back on at the end and go through those um, through those with with Joe. So, um, thank you so much for coming to join us, Joe. Really excited to have you here, and I'm going to disappear and and let you um, crack on. Thank you. Thank you, Jen, very much. And thank you for inviting me. It's really good to be here. It's been such a great week and so many varied things. Uh, and I promise, Claire, thank you for putting up that note, first of all, about the math, because I promise I will not uh, bamboozle you with math jargon. I've just been doing some the pleasures of homeschooling with primary school kids. And uh, yeah, the maths is sometimes uh, interesting, shall we say. So um, I wanted to start because it's a Friday afternoon and making sure that uh that we that we kick off in a sort of slightly alternative way so i wanted to start by asking a few questions now what you need to do it's this great free website which i'd highly recommend called menti.com so if you have your smartphone to hand um just stick this website address in www.menti.com and then stick in this code 456626. And how then you, um, how are you spelling menti, Joe? It's M E N T I. So menti.co, did you say? Uh, .com. Menti.com. So I'll pop that in the chat. And what was the code again? It's 456626. Yeah. Yeah. And if you just stick that in your browser, and then stick the stick the code in on your on either a phone or a, or a, or a computer, and then I thought it would be good to start about what we think, what we're enjoying about lockdown, considering there's you know a lot of negativity around. I thought it was good to think about some of the good stuff about it. And I can, for, for myself, I can definitely say I'm loving the fact that there's a lot less pollution, and I'm not hearing the air airplanes flying overhead so much. In fact, very little. So while everybody's just getting in there, oh, peace and quiet, yeah, that's a good one. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself. So I'm Jo, I set up Geeky uh, Social Enterprise with my husband, James, a uh, few years ago. And Geeky stands for Get Informed, Know Your Impact. And really, we just want to make it easier to live sustainably. And that's what sits at the heart of everything we're doing. I love this. Thinking time, that's a good one. Nature. There's definitely been a lot of surveys saying that people are really beginning to appreciate more and natural world, which is a good output from lockdown. Fantastic. Right, let's move on to the next question. So if you now this may come up automatically on on the browser or the laptop the, or the phone that you're on, or sometimes you have to click um, move to next slide. I think it says something like that. Um, That's good. Yeah, I think the I've measured it. Very, very few people are going to. Um, oh, there's one. But I think the no idea is generally where we are. Oh, it's bumping up. Oh. So I would say that um, it's generally knowing what our carbon footprint is, is not that common. And it's because it's not really it's not really part of our sort of regular mental framing. Most of us have just about got our head around around calories, um, but in terms of carbon footprint, you know, what does a ton of carbon actually mean? Um, 
it's not, let's just say it's not sort of common pub talk at the moment, but actually the fact that eight people have measured it, that's, that's pretty impressive. Nine. And then if we go on to the last question, I wanted to um, focus on some of the things that we can do to reduce our footprint uh, from recycling everything, cutting out food waste, turning your thermostat down by just one degree or switching to green electricity, which one has the biggest impact? Yeah, switching to green energy, it's in the lead at the moment. But cutting out food waste is actually a pretty good one. If you go from throwing out a lot of edible food to throwing out none at all, it's not going to have as big an impact as switching to green energy, but it actually can have quite a significant impact. And I, and I think what, what this shows is that there are, um, there are some clear wins, like switching to green energy, which, which definitely does have the biggest impact in terms of these four examples. But the other, there are lots of other things um, that we can do um, that really uh, all add up to reduce our impact. So after our little Menti uh, questionnaire, I wanted now to um, get into the nitty gritty, which I promise won't be, math won't be heavy on the maths, um, about um, what we can all do individually. So this graph shows what we need to do in terms of um, carbon emissions. So it shows how they've gone up really since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. This green spot is where we are today. This is where we need to get to by 2030 if we're to have a reasonable chance of capping temperature rise at one and a half degrees, which is um, thought to be the, 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 the right target to be aiming for from the scientific recommendations. And then we need to get to net zero by 2050. So clearly, no, we can't see the um, can't see your screen at the moment. Okay. Well, sorry about that. Now, why is that? Let me just see on my screen share application window. Now, just bear with us, guys. We're just trying to. Yeah. Sorry about this. Now, are you seeing? So now we can see. Yeah. We now we can see. Can um, you see the graph? We can see the, the thing with the wind turbines in the background and, and going up and, and now we can see it saying geeky. Okay, perfect. Right. I'm going to give you the wind. The wind. Now, are you seeing it full screen? Seeing it saying geeky, yeah, full screen. Okay, perfect. Here's the graph. Hopefully what I've just said makes more sense now. Um, so, you can, Jen, are you seeing the sort of full? Um, the, yeah, yeah, looks uh, perfect. Okay, so this is Industrial Revolution. This is where we need where we are today, and this is where we need to get to by 2030. So, so clearly, there's a lot of a change that needs to happen, and it really has to come from every direction. So, we obviously need a lot of policy change to encourage uh, behaviour change across the whole spectrum of, of our lives. Uh, we need businesses to change, but we also, as individuals and communities, can do a huge amount, and that's really what I wanted to talk about today. And I think in terms of what we can do, um, we split it out into various different areas. The first one is how we spend our money, what we buy. Um, I think most importantly, how much we buy um, and also who we buy from. And the how much we buy is something that I think we, it, it, it's so easy to keep accumulating stuff because it's so much part of the way culture is today, but actually, Lots. I mean, I certainly know I've got a lot of stuff in various cupboards that, that we don't use. And actually, we have a tendency to accumulate way too much stuff that we actually don't don't really need. Um, but then also choosing to buy from organ from organisations that are environmentally sustainable um, and, and making those choices, not only in terms of what we're supporting, but also the message that we're sending to businesses in terms of what we want as consumers or as individuals. Um, we can also at work influence the way business is done um, or encourage colleagues to uh, behave in more sustainable ways or embed sustainability more into uh, work practices. Um, for, for some lobbying uh, politicians or MPs or local councillors, sending messages, sending letters can, can be an effective way to, to, to try to make a difference. 
or going out on marches as well can can obviously with XR that's been increasingly popular in the in the schools for climate, which has really brought it to the fore in the last year or so. Um, and then at a more personal level, and our research shows that these that this sort of influencing friends and family is one of the those relationships, not surprisingly, are what are one of the strongest areas in terms of people deciding to make changes. So a lot of the research that we do in terms of um, the changes that people have already made, and when when we ask them why, it's because you know a friend, a close friend, or family member encouraged me to. Um, and then changing your bank or your pension or your savings, and I'll go into that in a bit more detail. And I know Becky spoke about that on Wednesday. It was really interesting. Um, that's that's an area that sometimes falls off the radar, but actually can make a really big difference. So um, I now wanted to talk about some very specific areas um, that uh, we could we we could uh, we could adopt some some or all of them, and it totally depends on your lifestyle and your priorities. And I think what's really important in in developing a more sustainable life is to make changes that are going to work for you and that actually fit within your lifestyle because actually committing to something that's totally unrealistic can just be demoralizing and and unlikely to remain part of your lifestyle for very long so the first area i wanted to look at was diet and i'll just move that over there um so our diet uh, or, or is about a quarter of our total carbon footprint so if um, there's been a, obviously a huge amount in the in the news and general uh, coverage around being more sustainable, but all about uh, cutting back on meat. Um, and what's really striking, actually, is if you cut back on red meat alone, which has a much higher carbon footprint than pork or chicken, for example, you can cut your the footprint of your diet by about a quarter. So if you want to cut out or swap up, swap out from one particular type of food, um, swapping red meat for you know all manner of other types of food can have a really big difference. Um, so this is just over a quarter of a ton you can cut potentially if you decide to swap away from red meat. Um, and the other thing to um, mention about red meat is it actually has about 20 times the carbon footprint of fruit and vegetables. And there are also um, a lot of issues around the feed that all, all, all animals are fed actually, which is typically or often soy. And 80% of soy is grown for animal food and is often grown in deforested areas in South America, around the Amazon, for example. Um, so if you if you decide to go full uh, meat free, fish free, dairy free for a mainly plant diet, that will cut another really big chunk off your um, off your food footprint. Um, and you can see it's affecting, you know, even even more of an impact than cutting out red meat. But I think what's what I wanted to show here was that you don't have to do everything uh, immediately and actually just sort of slicing. Uh, all the changes that you can make into the more specific areas can make it feel much easier and you can try things out see what works see what doesn't work um and that that's often the way that you can make changes most effectively um, so can I just ask a question there about yeah. food because you mentioned food waste earlier earlier on as one of yeah. the things on the, the menti thing but and and i think you know one of the 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 vegan um and sort of red meat thing yeah, being very polarizing, doesn't it? Um, but actually, I think we forget to talk enough about the impact of food waste. And actually, you yeah. know, if we're looking at our diets and the food that we're we're buying and eating, food waste. Um, you know, reducing your food waste does have a, a similar impact, I think, from the the figures I've seen as as to going kind of plant based. Is that something you've found as well? Yeah, well, I've actually, like, we can go on and look at the food waste. I've oh, got sorry, to... I didn't realise you were. <laughs> I've got... Um... No, 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 you can sit with your order, that's fine. No, 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 okay, no. No, okay I'll, I'll be quiet. <laughs> no, you're right, food waste is, it is a big win, it's, it definitely is. Um, and the divesting example here, I wanted to show this compared to green electricity, and green electricity is, is definitely, I mean, if there's one thing that you do this week, if you're not on a green, if you're not with a renewable energy company, that is, I would really recommend looking at that, but we'll, I'll talk about that again in a little bit more detail later, but divesting, so that is effectively, so this is about your money, so most of us have a bank account, 
um, some people have a pension and then some people might have ISAs or savings. Um, and I'm going to uh, focus mainly on the bank account now. But when we put our money, uh, you know, monthly salary, uh, whatever it might be, weekly salary in the bank um, with a with a regular high street bank, that that money doesn't just sit in that bank account it is deployed um, often to be lent to clients of the bank. Um, and the clients of um, all high street banks uh, range across a huge spectrum of industries, but often, often very frequently for high street banks, they would be energy companies, oil companies, um, organizations that uh, are investing in fossil fuel exploration and digging. And and um, and I think that sometimes that connection between the fact that actually our monthly salary might in part, you know, in small part, be being lent out for oil exploration, for example. I think that, that making that connection, it sometimes feels so tangential. But actually, if you um, decide that you want to Want your your save your bank your regular account or your um, savings account not to be used for those purposes, then it's worth looking at moving to either um, a fossil fuel free bank account or to building societies would tend not to not to lend out. Um, and good examples would be Triodos. They're a, a fossil fuel free bank. Uh, the co-op also is, and also Charity Bank. Um, and th those would all be you know, good fossil free options. Um, I'm now going to move on to. Food waste. So um, I have pulled out here some examples. Again, I put our green electricity as a sort of measure to show the impact that all of these can have in comparison. Um, and what I wanted to show with all of these was was how every every bit counts and some have a bigger impact than others, but cumulatively they can all have quite a significant impact. So this recycling everything you can, this 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 figure that we've pulled out here, just over a hundred kilos that you can save every year, um, is based on a UK average of we all recycle, you know, to an extent in the UK, but if you recycle absolutely everything that you can then that actually can make it quite a big difference. So things like uh, the insides of toilet rolls, uh, bottles in the bathroom that sort of somehow find their way into the into the bin, scrap bits of paper, you know, kids, kids' artwork that you've been dying to get rid of, but you're just trying to think of a way to sort of, you know, slide it off without them noticing. Um, some of these things we sort of, we don't always think about recycling everything that we possibly can. And um, so I am. Um, so if just focusing on, on that particular um, area can, can make quite a significant difference. And food waste, Jen, to your point, yeah, absolutely. So this, this figure of um, saving about a quarter of a tonne is based on going from wasting quite a, you know, re, a, quite a chunk of edible food. So that's not including things like peelings or banana skins um, to going to wasting absolutely nothing at all. And this is really about planning menus, making sure stuff doesn't get stuck at the back of the fridge and forgotten about, um, you know, keeping an eye on what's it, what's what's perishable every couple of days to make sure you use it up. And a lot of that is just about changing habits, but um, and also obviously a good money saver as well, cutting out on food waste. So that does actually, if we compare that to the previous slide around going red meat free, it's on a par exactly as you said Jen slightly lower but not significantly and this call a customer so this is about your thermostat so in the 1970s we heated our houses to around 12 degrees in the winter uh, now they're heated to about 20 degrees um, but the general consensus among sort of heating heating experts is that 18 degrees should be adequate or ample if you're you know reasonably active so just by shaving at one degree off your uh, what your thermostat settings, that can cut quite a decent chunk off your off your off your heating footprint, and again, a good money saver. 
Um, I then wanted to go on to retail therapy. And the reason I put this in there, because, you know, lockdown boredom, there's sometimes a bit of a tendency to uh, grab the phone and think about what we might be able to get online. Um, so in the UK, we buy on average about well over 30 pieces of clothing or footwear each every year. And obviously, clothing has an impact from um, a production perspective. There's obviously a, there are carbon emissions associated, but there's also quite a, pollute, quite a lot of pollution associated around um, preparing of the materials, chemicals used, pesticides used for growing cotton, water usage, etc. So the the environmental footprint of the clothing industry, which has got quite a lot of coverage, um, is is quite significant, and um, all all um, you know, driven by our desire to have, you know, quite a high numbers of clothing per person. So if we cut that average of over 30 per person per year to just 10 per person per year, that can cut about a quarter of a ton about this. That's exactly the same on a par with the food waste bar chart that we saw earlier and just a touch lower than the red meat one. Um, and if Reducing the numbers is tricky. Another option is to go second hand. And there's been a real, real explosion actually in the second hand clothing industry recently. So obviously eBay was one of the pioneers, but now there are sites like Depop, there are sort of super posh high end ones like Rebel, where they sell all sorts of designer kits second hand. And there really is something for everybody now. Um, and I think it's becoming, certainly among the younger generations, much more fashionable. Um, and a lot of the students that we work with, they say they never buy new clothes anymore, they always go vintage. And it's often called vintage, not second hand anymore. And I think that's just a show of how perceptions have really changed around second-hand clothing. Um, so that's another good one to think about. Um, and I just wanted to mention Scarlett. So she's one of the people who are doing quite a lot of work with recently. She's a recent graduate. And she focused on um, trying to reduce her footprint using Geeky Zero, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. But what, what I wanted to show with her was that actually by adopting quite a few different steps over a period of a couple of months, she could actually shave quite a decent amount off her footprint. So she managed to cut over a ton in a couple of months. And she also saved money as a result of some of the, some of the changes that she made, which ranged from going to green electricity, which she was kind of amazed about. It only took her 15 minutes on the phone and it didn't cost her anymore. She did the thermostat change. She reduced some of the, the you know the amount of cheese that she was eating, which which has a you know quite not, not as higher impact as meat, but still is quite carbon intensive as term in terms of how food foods go. Um, she went red meat free. She did sort of smaller impacts around the house. She turned all her lights off instead of leaving them on, and she stopped leaving all of her um, devices on standby. And she started contacting companies on social media asking them to change. So. I think it shows that that it it's the sort of incremental um, changes over time. You're not just going to suddenly wake up one morning and have a sustainable life. It is something that takes time, and the habits take time to embed in our lifestyles. But I think as we get used to them, actually, what we found with a lot of the research that we've done is that people see take real pleasure and see real benefit in the changes that they've made above and beyond what they initially imagined that they'd get. So. Um, so I just wanted to give you, I wanted to use Geeky Zero actually, which we're launching in a couple of weeks, just to um, highlight some of the things that it, it's useful to think about when we're thinking about living more sustainably. Um, so this chart here, this the, the red one with the, with the carbon on, so this is really a personal distilled version of the, of the, um, the chart I showed you in terms of where we need to get by 2030 and 2050 from an individual perspective. So this is this is a screenshot from um, from Geeky Zero. Now this UK average here. So this is this this is the UK average footprint, which is just over 9,000 kilos per person per year. Now to cap the threshold of the the, the temperature rise at one and a half degrees we need to get to here by 2030, each of us, which is two and a, two and a half thousand kilos. So just like the graph we saw earlier, this shows how significant the changes that we need to make. Um, and the areas that, that sit within our domain of control really, is it at home? You know, what, how, how we insulate it, how we heat it, 
um, how we look after it, how we, you know, what, what we do in it, um, what we eat, how we get around transportation, um, what we buy and the services that we use. So that's anything from banking to holidays, those kind of things. And I, we believe that if you measure, it really helps you understand because I think often, even when you think a lot about these things, it can be really surprising to identify parts of our lives that are like, crikey, I didn't realise that had such an impact. So, so if you just, um, if you want to turn your video off for a second, it just make the slide bigger for people to be able to, to see it a bit better. Yeah, why don't I do that? How do I do that? If you, if you, again, wave sort of over your bit of the thing and it, actually I can probably do it for you, toggle video, so I'll just turn you off for a minute. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. So... Yes, yeah, so here this so this um, particular person's put in a flight from Heathrow to New York, which uh, the footprint of which, if you fly economy, is just over two tons, but there and back, if you fly business, it's a lot higher. Um, so that's you know just short of a quarter of, of of the total annual footprint. So you can see flights really do make up a, a big chunk, particularly long haul. Um, just going to scroll down to the next one. There we go. Um, and not all of us have an appetite for putting in copious amounts of data, but estimates are going to get us a long way there. So, you know, things around what we eat. It's, you know, eating everything is, as we discussed earlier, has a very different dietary footprint to being vegan. Um, and increasingly, people are being kind of mainly veggie or mainly plant based rather than going the whole hog. Um, but then, some people do want to put in all the information of, on everything they eat. So, so that's also another way. And that's just, you know, totally depends on your personality, really. Um, the other key area is once you've understood um, the biggest areas of your impact, you know, what can you actually do to, to, to lighten it? And so we've chosen um, or we've assessed and researched well over 100 different steps that people can take and rated them in terms of how easy or difficult they are so from easy peasy through to hardcore and what their impact is on the planet so everything from small impact through to planet saver and we've also um, identified which areas each step can help so for example this one here buying clothing um, made from organic cotton or wool so this is all about um, reducing chemical usage um, reducing use of pesticides um, so that has carbon benefits biodiversity benefits and also water benefits um, and, and i think one of the challenges about being sustainable is that we're we get so much information and it's sometimes conflicting and it's really hard to weigh up how big an impact a change we want to make is going to have. And, you know, plastic straws are a really great example that they got so much coverage. Um, and it's it's really excellent that plastic straws are, are no longer widely used. But in terms of individual changes that we can make to help the environment, that's probably not the biggest one. And I think it's, it's really important that we can all kind of get a as good an understanding as is possible in terms of what the impact of each step that we could take is and then we can make an informed decision as to whether we're going to do it um but i've thrown a lot of information at you um if it feels uh, somewhat overwhelming i just wanted to pick out three that um are really big wins um you know not each of them not for everybody um, but the Go Renewable Energy uh, with, a, with a company that is 100% renewable is a you know, really good one. I know Jen ran a campaign around that recently. Um, swapping out red meat, if there's anything you're going to change in your diet, that's a good one to take a look at. And changing your bank account as well, as we talked about, is, is, a, is definitely one to investigate. Um, and there are more options now than there used to be. And there's more information now, although it is still an area that... that there could be a lot more choice and a lot more um, information around it is a kind of burgeoning area that I think there's more awareness around. So that's definitely one to look into as well. And that is all that I wanted to say. The only thing I wanted to add before we get on to any questions was that um, 
if you want, so Geeky Zero is going to go live in a couple of weeks. It's totally free. Um, and it's, uh, so if you want to uh, hear what, what, if you want us to let you know when it launches, you can just sign up here. Or if you don't want to sign up for our newsletter, just drop me an email here and I'll just pin you the link when it goes live. Amazing, um, Joe. Thank you. That's a pleasure. Um, I've got I've got a couple of questions I want to ask straight away. Um, the, the the app is it Android and iPhone? It's actually a website and web app. So it is um, what's called mobile first in the tech jargon, which basically means we've designed it to work on a mobile phone as just to look and feel like an app. Oh, but okay. it's actually a website. So can we download it sort of as an app? As, you, know? uh, so you can put a um, an image on your phone, um, which then looks like an app, and then you just click on it and it takes you straight to it. Yeah. Perfect. Um, I don't know if such a thing exists and if you've got or if you've got access to the data, but um, Alexander was on um, at the start of the week talking about Project Drawdown and like the yeah, 100, 100 um, uh, solutions, uh, sort of ranked solutions. And, and one of the things I said to him was that I kind of zone out a bit of Project Drawdown because so many of them feel unapplicable to me as an individual, whereas all these ones that you've gone through, is there such a thing as like the top 10 ranked individual actions we can we can do? Because it would be so lovely just to be able to go tick, tick, tick. Oh, yeah, I need to do that one. Do you know of, of those like top 10? And, and you know, if it, if it was like if everybody, if you did this top 10, it chunks a quarter off your carbon footprint or something. It'd be really lovely to... It was. Unfortunately, it rather de it depends on your personal situation. Mm. So, if if, for example, you have family abroad mm. and try to see them regularly, and you live in a big drafty country house and use an oil boiler, yeah, then your your um your biggest wins, which would be reduce your fly and you know get rid of the oil boiler. Yeah. Yeah. would be very different than if you live in a flat in you know central manchester and yeah. you know great technology in terms of you know heating and all that so it's i mean that green electricity i would definitely say is uh that's kind of a no-brainer because that's been drumming that in this week i really yeah. hope that everybody has done that i've put the link there for big clean switch here in energy comparison site so you know hop on there with a the recent bill and do it you can do it now while we're still talking and mm. um yeah, come back and let us know if you have. But yeah, complete no brainer, as you say. Yeah, and 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 the the financial, you know, the banking side. The older we get, the more relevant that becomes because of the size of pension, etc. Um, but you know, finance is you know complex, and you need to yeah, you need to have confidence that any changes that you're making are the right ones. Mm. So that that's a that's a much more complicated one. Um, diet is you know diet, changing our diet can have a big impact but again that's not quite as straightforward as the green electricity because it depends on your personal situation mm -hmm. you know there are so many so much of this is so personal it's about it's it's about finding what's right for you um, yeah. and that's why we try well that's why we wanted to link it to individual footprints because then you can pick and choose the bits yeah. that work best for you but it is it, and that's one of the challenges that it's really it's really personal and also you know, if you live in when we first uh, tested this first version of this we did it at the Eden project and everybody in Cornwall has to drive because there's yeah. no public transport that's you know provides this kind of decent infrastructure service so they all said well there's no way I can you know reduce them my mileage or mm -hmm. And so that those choices just weren't there for them. Whereas if you live in a city, that's yes. a much easier choice. Yeah. Um, and I, I commented earlier on in the chat, actually, that, you know, I think maybe the reason lots of people on this thing have, have measured their carbon footprint is because we had the talk with Luke earlier on in the week and and he flagged up a couple of sites to do it. But I've done the WWF one. Yeah. Um, and, and we talked about this at, at the time. It, it's quite a blunt tool, isn't it? It's quite a, you know, because it's, as you say, everybody's under such different circumstances, but it, mm. it, it the frustration I feel, and, and I've spoken to other people about this, is that it doesn't recognise if you go, you know, if you if you lose a family car, yes, it, it you know, it knocks something off your carbon footprint, but if you decide to cycle to work two days a week rather than than drive, it doesn't it doesn't acknowledge that and it doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Is yours able to sort of take into account those those smaller tweaks yeah so we ha we've created a, a score system within it because we realized that um looking at your carbon footprint per se is not going to make us leap up and down for joy because <laughs> 
it's, you know, let's face it, a ton of carbon is quite meaningless to, you know, it's just a concept that's quite hard to get your head around. So we created this score, which incorporates your carbon footprint, but also the steps that you've committed to and the steps that you've completed, because actually it's all about progress. Mm. And the starting point is important, but it's not, you know, you could have a really high carbon footprint, but because you progress quickly and you take a lot of steps, actually, in terms of your end end game, that could be you know, your end situation. It could be you could be in a much more sustainable situation than somebody who started with a lower carbon footprint. So, um, yes, in answer to your point, the score recognizes positive steps that are exactly like that. You know, deciding yeah. to um, do things that are more sustainable. Yeah, I'm I'm smiling away at the chat because. Um, uh, these, everyone's like we've now become this self-moderating community so someone asks a question and, and someone else in the community is able to come in and answer it for them so it's absolutely wonderful oh, that's great. um there's quite a few questions in the ask a question box yeah. so we'll just work our way through them um does the app or is it able to work on sort of locally grown and uk boot, boot based food versus flown in produce so um that's a good question. So the uh, Geeky Zero um, looks at your whole, I guess it's more, although the way that we build the data is it's bottom up, it looks at your life from sort of um, top down level rather than a product specific level. Um, so we wouldn't look at whether or not your um, your fruit and veg is flown versus not flown, but we do, well, we do ask whether you buy it locally, actually. So that is a factor, mm -hmm. but yeah, so that is a factor that feeds in, but actually from a product perspective, um, Geeky Badge is the app that we already launched a couple of years ago, which looks at supermarket products, is more product focused and Geeky Zero is more kind of lifestyle focused. On on that point, because it's really hard to, to often to know whether food has been especially fruit and veg whether it's been flown in mm. and I know, um like mike Berners lee in his book gives some amazing stats that like you know um i can't remember what it is but like a punnet of imported strawberries flown in has a much higher or the similar impact to like a kilo of steak or something like that i can't mm. remember the exact things but it's really hard to know if things are, are flown in does um the geeky badges app if you scan things does that give you that information no, I mean we don't know either, to be honest. I mean most of the if if it's if it's low, so we recognise if it's UK made, um, which you can, you know, yeah, I think we can be fairly confident it's not flown in. Um, I think the the most fruit and veg that's European wide is not flown in, mm. um, but no, I mean in all honesty, it's very difficult to tell. Mm. Wouldn't um, it be great if they had to put a little aeroplane sticker on it? Yeah. So you. <laughs> then they probably wouldn't sell so well. Though. Yeah, exactly. Um, if we eat red meat or poultry from a local butcher, will that lower the carbon footprint rather than buying it from the supermarket where maybe it was flown over from New Zealand? There are some mental stats about lamb from New Zealand and, and how apparently it's got a lower carbon footprint. And I'm happy yeah. to say it has. I don't know. It has. I don't know. I think for the, lamb, the lamb New Zealand argument is all about the fact that the this, the biggest part of the impact with red meat, it, meat is the production rather than the transportation. Um, so that's where that argument comes from. Um, in terms of local, um, like buying locally versus supermarket in terms of meat, I mean, clearly there are often way more benefits in terms of animal welfare. Often it's more organic, which has animal welfare and biodiversity benefits. In terms of a specific, um, you know, farm by farm, to be honest, we don't have a way of knowing that. I think the only way that you could know that is to ask the butcher if they'd carbon footprinted it. Um, but it's very difficult to find product footprint data. It just doesn't yeah. exist. So corn have actually just started footprinting their individual products and as have Oatly, the, the, the oat milk company. Mm. But um, it's quite, un it, yeah, I mean, it's very unusual for individual products to be footprinted, but I mean, they're, they're often with buying from a local butcher versus a supermarket, other benefits. And often the local butcher, they, they may well know the farm that it's come from. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as a general rule of thumb, I would say for meat, look, you know, lower intensive systems, yeah. lower intensity systems are going to have lower carbon footprints. So your, you know, your organic beef is a very low intensive system. Um, and I know red meat's got this really high carbon footprint, but, you know, when you compare it to um, factory farmed beef from America, you know, mm -hmm. like 
it's like comparing apples and pears. It's it's very different things to compare, isn't it? So, um, Claire, I would say, you know, have get to know your local butcher, have a chat with them. They will know probably the vast majority of the farms that they're sourcing from. So um, they can advise you as to which might sort of fit most with your values. Um, let's have a look. The food waste um, figure that you shared, was that per person or per yeah, household? That's per person. Brilliant, okay. Um, uh, Marie, will the calculator take into consideration people who live alternatively? I live on a boat. Interesting. And give this as an option. Yeah, I'm afraid we don't yet. That is a very interesting one. And on the 400 people we've tested it on so far, that is not an issue that all questions <laughs> come up. So I'll talk to my colleagues about that. It, but it must depend on the type of boat as well and whether you move it or whether it's mm. static. Because if you if it's a moving boat and it's a sailing boat, that would be very different from if it's a moving boat and it's motorized or if it's a static boat and yeah. how you eat it. And I'm just thinking aloud, the complexity is, uh, yeah. no, I'm sorry, we don't at the moment. Yeah. Um, Brenda asked if we could say a bit more about the, the impact of flying. And Brenda, yeah. I'll pop a, um, a podcast um, link into the chat as well, because I've got a brilliant chat with, I've got two chats actually, one with Vicky Smith from Earth Changers. We talk a lot about, I um, uh, can't remember what she calls it. It's sort of like positive travel. I can't remember. It's not the right way for um, looking at it. But um, and also, and I've got another one with Anna Hughes from the Flight Free Twenty Twenty campaign. So I'll pop those in there. But um, Joe, if you want to, yeah. So flying is flying is definitely the most carbon intensive form of travel, apart from cruise ships. Cruise ships are even more intensive uh, because you tend to have to fly to a fly to your fly to your cruise departure point get on a five-star moving hotel and then fly back. So ignoring cruises, flying is the most carbon intensive form of transport. And it's not because they're particularly inefficient. It's just because they're very big and they go a very long way. So um, we compared uh, the footprint of getting the train to Paris versus the flight. And it was about five times different. And so trains, and again, this depends on which country they're in. In France, the electricity supply is generally nuclear. Uh, you know, far, uh, most, of, most of their electricity is powered by nuclear. So it's much lower carbon footprint than many other countries. But irrespective of that, trains are a very environmentally or low impact way of traveling in terms of emissions um, and planes are just generally high impact uh, long long haul um greater than short haul not surprisingly um but if you yeah i mean if if you that there's until the industry finds a way to um transport us by air with some sort of different technology, it's hard to see how that's going to reduce. And there are more efficient planes. It's definitely improving, but you know, it's very incremental rather than than dramatic change at this stage. Brilliant, thank you. Um, let's have a look. Uh, 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 but can you track carbon for individual journeys through the app? Robert's self-employed and keen to track his sort of business travel. Yes, you, you could. At the moment, we don't split between um, business so that you can't sort of tick a box and say this is business, this is personal. Um, but yes, yeah, so you can put in, a, you can either estimate, you can say, I do, you know, I don't know, three long haul, two short haul flights a year. Or you can put in each individual flight and select which class you fly, uh, whether it's return or not. And then okay. that will show you. Yeah. And and does it also do that for so if I was like um oh I've I've got um an event I've been asked to speak at and it's in Cambridge but I'm, and I'm either going to get the train or I'm going to drive yeah. would it, could I could I put that in there and it would let me know if I wanted to offset it so you could put in uh, your train journey um, on the car questions we ask you how many miles you um, drive per year actually so we haven't designed it such that you can put in i'm going london to cambridge yeah what's the footprint but I'm you sure there are um, websites that you can probably do that on aren't there there might, yeah, I, I'll ask James. I'm honestly not, I, I, I'm, I'm sure there are. I don't know is the short answer, but yeah. um, there might well be. Yeah. Um, 
Great question here. Uh, oh, I've been asked to join a panel discussion on the 6th of June. Well done, Beth, at her local climate cafe about staycations, slow travel and ethical travel. Can I flag Geeky Zero? Will it be launched oh, by the 6th of June? Yes, of launched? course you can. It will be launched in the week uh, beginning 25th of May. So, oh, yeah. how exciting. That would be brilliant. Thank you, Beth. And we actually did a blog recently on uh, that we wrote before uh, lockdown comparing um, different holiday options and a camping holiday compared to a five star hotel. This is just the accommodation, not uh, not how you get there. Uh, so a five star hotel has uh, 18 times the footprint of staying in a tent. <laughs> Some would argue 18 times the comfort as well, but you know. <laughs> I guess it depends how thick your mattresses are. <laughs> how good you are at campsite cooking. <laughs> Um, the really interesting question here, what was the reason you went for a web app versus a, a, a you know, what we, a traditional app sounds like the wrong yeah. thing to say, but does that reduce the carbon footprint? Um, it reduces the costs. Okay. Uh, so in all honesty, we built it on a web app because it was, it's much more expensive to build an app than a website. Um, and I think, and because um, of the way that technology is evolving, actually web apps, which to all, which look and feel like an app, um, are becoming more common and more popular. I think, uh, yeah, so that, that that's the simple reason, to be honest, because there's so much going on in the back end in terms of data and analysis um, that it, this was the most effective way to build it now. Yeah. Um, and Trina's asking, does it, um, is there anywhere that, that the app can take into account offsetting? Uh, so, no is the short answer. The longer answer is um, we have an element in there called uh, trees, um, which looks at tree planting and uh, rainforest preservation. And the reason that we've included them um, and not offsetting at this stage is um, in terms of the science around the most effective ways to um, positively give back, should we say, in terms of, you know, other than just changing our behaviours, um, the trees are by far the best technology that exists um, in terms of carbon absorption. Um, so I think, you know, our, our, what, what we think is the, the best approach is, you know, make changes to our life first, make reductions where we can. Um, and I genuinely would say that a lot of the changes that we've made have been really life enhancing. And actually, our life is much better as a result of the changes that we've made because, you know, things become simpler. You haven't got a million and one choices. It's just, yeah, it, it has a lot of a lot of actually unforeseen advantages. Um, but um, and then plant trees or preserve forests, um, because that's in terms of the science that that's where the strongest evidence is in terms of impact. Yeah, and I think, you know, if you are looking at offsetting, um, go back and check out that talk with Luke and he was talking about there are there are a couple of standards and actually Vicky talks about this in, in our podcast. There's an awful lot of greenwashing around carbon offsetting and you need to be really careful who you pick. So there are um, there are two standards, I think. One's a gold standard that Luke talked about. Mm -hmm. the, the, the two that are recommended are both sort of um, recommended by David Attenborough and um, all those. Sorts. So do, do have a look at what those um, sort of accreditation systems are and pick pick one of those. That's um, right. The, the, the gold standard you mentioned is a, a, originally a WWF one. So the credibility around that is, is one yeah. of the strongest in terms of offsetting. Um, and um, there, Karen says there are lots of footprint calculators. How does this one improve measuring? Um, so what we wanted to do with this was instead of just helping measure, actually show what you can do with that measurement. Because I think just measuring um, in a static form can be really helpful in terms of just giving you an overview. But actually, like, then what do I do with this? I've got, uh, you know, okay, I know my footprint is tons or whatever. And how, how does that relate to me? What am I meant to do with it? How can I change it? So we wanted to add that how can I actually change it and what can I do and and help understand um, what you know what, what the ben what the pros and cons are of each change really. Mm. I liked that um, on one of the slides you showed as well where you had that you know the sort of bar and then and then the proportions I guess of, of the part of your carbon footprint of the bits that we can control yeah. um, that was quite interesting to look at as well so um, yeah, yeah. That's what I will vary for everybody totally depending on oh, okay your lifestyle yes. yeah 
travel a lot, then transportation is going to be much bigger. But if you don't travel but live in a sort of drafty house, mm. then it will probably be bigger. Yeah. And I guess that's one of the issues, isn't it, that we talked about this this right at the, the start of the week. You know, what does sustainability even mean? And actually, you know, even if we've got our head around that, what it means for us, that it's so personal, the changes that, we're, that are in our within our control to make. Um, you know, if we, it might be that we live in a drafty house, but we rent it and we can't do a huge amount about that. But um, yeah. so, you know, that's massively where the sort of ish comes in, isn't it? And not being prescriptive and not being um, judgmental and things. Um, brilliant. Thank you so much, Joe. There's just if anybody wants to, to whack a, a question in in just the next minute or two. Yeah, and I'm just going to, can I just, I'm going to stick my email. Oh, yeah, all your links in, yeah. If anyone wants to email about anything. And um, should I also stick in, I'm just going to stick in this link as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, stick, in, stick in all the links. And then. Um, and, and just to, um, Joe's other app, Geeky Badges. Um, yes, there we go. So uh, that's to sign up for the, to know when the new app's coming out, is it? Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's for our regular newsletter. So that has, we'll have, so we'll send that out when the new app goes live in a couple of weeks. But also we put general sustainable living tips and, you brilliant. know, stuff around um, geeky badges as well. And, and the Geeky Badges app, um, I've got a podcast with, with Joe on that actually that I'll share with you guys. And, um, basically like you download it and you can scan every, all your food products can't you and, and it lets you know all these different badges that it hits and things but if your kids are bored during lockdown download the app and as long as you don't mind them you know going through your cupboards maybe it gives you a chance to clean your kitchen cupboards mine have been done for years but you know I just think that that's a really great thing to do with our kids and to then all those different conversations that it will spark about palm oil about um i don't know air transport or whatever these things around our food and i just that's a really nice kind of home ed project almost isn't it that um that we can do with the kids during lockdown so yeah, yeah. we get uh, yeah still get sort of challenged about what is this in the cupboard it's oh like really a, it's, a demo, it's a demo product i would say <laughs> <laughs> oh bless them oh that's really good you've got your own little um activists there um <laughs> I just want to quickly flag to everyone, um, we've got uh, the sort of festival closer tonight at eight o'clock because um, I didn't share that till late. So um, if people want to come and join me and pop the link there at eight o'clock tonight, I will attempt in some way to wrap up this amazing week and um, and also, you know, try and cut through a little bit of that overwhelm that anybody might be feeling in terms of like, I've learned all this stuff and I don't know what to do first now. So um, I'll be sharing, you know, just sharing some ideas for you for how you you create a really sort of solid action plan for for going forward so it'd be really nice to have lots of people live on that call to really feel like it was a end of festival um thing so so yeah do come and join us guys and for anyone who's not on the facebook group you won't have seen me sharing the kofi um page for um if anybody wants to donate to um towards the sort of cost of the festival so um i'll just pop that down there as well but joe it's been amazing and i'm, I'm so impressed like I'm always really impressed that, you know, you've done all this work with Geeky Badges and then you're like, that wasn't enough. We're going to go and do this other app. <laughs> so, um, well, as, you, as you found from writing your book, it's it's like a minefield, isn't it? And actually, it's it should be easy. It should yeah. be easy to sustainably and it isn't. And actually, yeah, that's it's as simple as that, really. Yeah. Um, it's not. Well, thank you. And oh, thank, thank you so much. Today. Thank really you for a great awesome. festival. Oh, no. Yeah. So 25th of May, bookmark that, guys. What's that? 10 days time. You're on the 10 day countdown, Joe. Um, and we'll be looking to download that. Thank you so much. And, Thank uh, you very much. Catch you very soon. Take care.